best over 400 meters and with Reynolds in the field as well they've got to keep literally an eye over their shoulder here Thomas made his usual strong start there third from the left he's already overtaking the athletes uh, outside him and Roger Black has got his sights fixed on the back of Thomas at the moment Richardson some way back off those two and Reynolds not really in the hunt here it's Thomas and Black I'm Ewan Thomas, a former British athlete, I suppose best known for still holding the British record. I've had that 23 years, which makes me very proud to think I'm the fastest Briton ever over one lap of the track. Thomas seems to be holding on, Richardson's getting close, but Ewan Thomas finishes his season with a win, and it was a British 1-2-3. I was a European champion, Commonwealth champion, world champion and Olympic silver medalist all over a short distance I'm allowed. I was a sprinter. I was about getting from A to B quickly and powerfully. Not this time around, you're built for survival. It's a big difference. This is survival, not speed. <laughs> Winchester to Eastbourne. I wouldn't want to drive it in, without having a break, running it up hills. I really, really want to be able to finish this. I'd love to be able to tell you with confidence I'm going to do it. But as I sit here right now, I don't know. I don't know if people can comprehend how far 100 miles is. Okay, hang on. I'm going to find it. I had it. Oh, here we are. Okay, South Downs Way. Right, do you recognise this? Well, I've become friends with an ultra, a distance runner called Susie Chan, and um, literally all the time we joke about, oh, I reckon I could run a bit further, and I've done a marathon before. In fact, I've done eight London marathons, and I think I made a kind of silly bet with Mike Seaman from The Running Show and Susie that I could do an ultra. Next map. What do you mean, next map? <laughs> Are we halfway yet? No. Can you I'm just see trying this? to see where I am. Bognor Regis. Bognor Regis. We could go to Butlins. Butlins, on the way back. <laughs> And Susie's three. words were, you could do a 50 mile race and people would respect you, but if you want to be known as a double R, you know what, do a Centurion, you've got to. So I said, all right, let's do it. So basically I agreed to do in the South Downs Way a Centurion, which is 100 miles in June. And at the moment I'm just trying to train for it really and get my head around the fact that I don't know if I can do it. Mm. I've gone a bit quiet. Like you have gone quiet. I'm I actually tell you, looking at this now and I'm thinking, I, know, I, I know. don't know why I've agreed to try I know, and do this. I know, because you can. Here is a 400 meter track. No way. 400 meters. So this race finishes, finishes on the track. Finishes on the track. So that, that you're gonna you got you got no a marathon is a hundred four hundreds. Mm -hmm. So this is four. Is this about? This is gonna be a four four hundred four hundred. So yeah, four hundred hundred. Four hundred four hundred. Yeah. This is my route when I train. Within not even a whole square. <laughs> Within one square of a square. So I'm starting where my head is. My head is at home. Back down 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 down. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, this is... Oh. That is far. Okay, it is more... Oh, hang on. Isn't it? Yeah. There we go. Let's go. So when we started the training off, Ewan, even though he's an Olympian and even though he's got this huge calibre as a sportsman, in terms of endurance running, he was starting Pretty much at zero. It's Tuesday morning. I've got no motivation. If I'm totally honest, and I'm embarrassed saying this, I've not done one training run without Susie yet. And she's been on at me saying, are you doing all right? You need to be running twice a day. And I'm like, yeah, yeah it's cool. I've done nothing. I'm moaning about a five mile run and I've got to do 95 miles more than that. So a hundred miles is a very long way and it's, it's not something you can just get up and do. However, to do it safely, to do it sensibly, and to make it as least painful as possible, you need to build up the miles uh, slowly and steadily. And we didn't have a huge amount of time to do any of those things. What we need to do is take him from 
that comfortable five miles up to a very uncomfortable 50 miles a week. It had to be cranked up at a reasonable pace because of the time frame we had in which to do that. It's a beautiful day. Shame my body isn't beautiful. My body is broken. How are you feeling about 100 miles? Um, if I'm totally honest, yeah. at the moment, this ain't happening. It'll be all right. It was um, very touch and go whether or not he had the run fitness by the time we got to the new year. By far the hardest thing I've ever had to deal with in my life. Because face the reality, I nearly lost my son. When my boy was born, he was perfectly fine. Came back to have a shower, then had a phone call saying, you need to come back to the hospital. I was, why? He stopped breathing, he's in intensive care. A really vigilant midwife said, no, no, something's really weird with that breathing. You need to check for strep B. And we'd never heard of it. And what strep B is just basically a bacteria, a virus that one in four women naturally carry. And if they pass it on to their child when they give birth, even after hospital treatment, one in 10 babies will still die. I just remember seeing him there get rushed, rushed off with all the tubes in the incubator. And I was, like, I was thinking, what is going on? And I was trying to be the tough, supportive dad Four different doctors I'd never seen before ran into the room and just picked him up out of the incubator and said, we need to take him away now. And they were testing to see if it had gone into his, like, um, his spine and into his brain, whether he developed meningitis. And the worst bit is we had to wait another 24 to 48 hours for the results. So you're just like a, it's like a ticking time bomb. And then eventually with antibiotics and so forth, he just got better and better. And then eventually we, we got to bring him home, which was amazing. The NHS don't screen for it, but you can go private and it costs 30 quid. You can have a private test and it's simple. If, if the mother is a carrier, they have antibiotics and then the baby's going to be fine. So on the one hand, I'm really angry and I don't understand why in this country, where most European countries do, we don't screen for it. But then on the other hand, I love the NHS for saving my boy's life. But I kind of think the 10 days he was in intensive care, that costs more than 30 quid to keep him alive. Lots of people have contacted me and said, I've never heard of it, I've been tested, I'm a carrier, thank you for highlighting it. I'll now get the, get the treatment I need. And then other people saying, we weren't so lucky, we've lost our son, we lost our daughter, our boy. It's a horrific illness that um, affects a lot of people and you, people have never heard of it, as we hadn't. If I can do this 100 mile race, I don't, so it's going to hurt, so do you know what, it's going to hurt me for 27 hours, it's going to be horrific for weeks afterwards. But if I can just help one person, just one, then it is so worth it. This may sound really stupid, but it's almost like learning to walk again. I've had to change a lot about myself to become an ultra runner. A lot of people would think there's a perception if you're an athlete, you're an athlete, what's the difference? You're just running a bit slower and a lot further. It, it's so different. The running style, you know, for example, as a sprinter, I was pure power. I was like a gazelle, it was all about high hips, knee lift, power through the arms, drive, fast as you can go from A to B. And all of a sudden it's totally opposite. It's don't use your arms too much, conserve energy, tiny little steps and, and just learn to pace myself and think I'm out here for hours rather than 44 seconds. It's, it's really hard to change who I am. I'm just saying, the way I'm feeling, I might have one of these benches myself next year. He died halfway up Love my memory. <laughs> of a well-known sprinter who attempted a centurion. Rest his soul. <laughs> <laughs> There was a lot of tough times in, in the training cycle, purely because of what was happening globally. It was very difficult. There were periods of time where we just simply weren't allowed to, to meet up. He definitely feeds off running with people and having people to run against and, re, and people to run with. So that was, there was a period of time where that was actually really, really tough. He's not so good left to his own devices, I would say. <laughs> He's better off with somebody cracking the whip. It's amazing what you can do. If, the, if, the, if you knew the finish was a marathon today, you would have got through a marathon. Wouldn't you? No, I know the body. I, I get you. Having to get used to even taking on fluids, taking on food. When you're, as an athlete, you don't stop and have a, a, a bit of a nutrition bar off a round or stop and all can have a sip of drink. It, it, it's, it's not what I do. And now all of a sudden I've had to adapt my body to be able to learn to eat on the move. I mean, that's been one of the hardest things and one of the biggest lessons. An hour and a half non-stop of hill reps. 
yeah. eight, oh, just over eight miles of running, but it felt like, that felt like a half marathon or worse. Yeah, you did, I was very, really impressed. You're in good spirits though. Yeah, I'm good today. Yeah. I needed this, I've had a bit of a rough week, so I think sometimes people don't appreciate the strength you get from being out and exercising. Yeah. I've never finished training and felt worse than when I started, so it's good for there as well as down here. Yeah. I was in a really good place until December the 10th and then I had a car crash and I didn't really think about it at the time but I think it really rocked me mentally as well. Physically I got hurt, basically I was on a slip road joining the motorway, two cars ahead of me stopped, I had to stop, I looked in the mirror, it was literally in slow motion, the car behind I could see wasn't even looking, went straight through the back of me, car was written off, hurt my neck, my shoulder and my back, so I didn't train for three months. So that, that really didn't help. We lost a lot of time. He couldn't run for some period of time, which was a huge blow, frankly, um, to the training cycle. The whole thing, I would say, I would actually genuinely use the phrase, ground to a halt. I just became really paranoid that I'd, lo I'd lost so much training. I kind of turned the corner and uh, we did a marathon. which off not a lot of training, I was quite surprised. I found it relatively all right. So we did the marathon and then I got the dreaded news that I was going to have to do a qualifying 50 mile race to prove myself for the 100. Obviously double the distance I've ever been. This came at a crucial time for him. By this point he hadn't really done anywhere near as much of the training as I would like to have done and it, it was a real Decider. So today is a 50 mile training run, which will be the furthest we've run before this. The furthest we've run is 26.2 miles. 50 miles is a long way for anyone, so it's quite a lot of responsibility. So I'm a little bit nervous, but we'll get through it. It's going further than I've ever been before. I've just come up to 35 miles. When I was a proper athlete, the furthest I've run is two miles. Look at me now. I've become the ultra runner. I can't remember the last time I've pushed myself to breaking point. My career was cut short because of injuries, my body isn't good. I've had surgeries, I've had all sorts. I think I, I have the mindset to be able to perhaps push through the pain barrier and not quit, but it's whether my body will quit on me. That's the real unknown, whether my body can take that punishment over such a prolonged period. Training is one thing. You can be super trained and your head's gotta be in the game for you to be able to finish. Very fit people, crash and burn. The 50 miler was an eye opener. I had to do it, but there was always a risk by doing that that I could hurt myself. And unfortunately, that's what happened. The 50 miler for the first 35 miles, well, I say brilliant, it hurt, but I got to like 20 miles and I felt great. And then at mile 35, something in my left foot just, just went. I, I truly thought I'd broken a bone in my foot and I limped the last 15 miles. I feel emotional already. One mile to go, I can't believe it. One mile, we've been out here for. 10 hours, 40 minutes, one minute. Everything hurts, everything hurts, like hamstring cramping, knees gone. But that is like proper injury, I know the difference, but. I've had scans and it's shown there is no damage to the bone, but I have damaged all the ligaments on my foot. So I've rested like five weeks and I've done two little runs in the last five weeks to test it. And if I'm being honest, it's not all right, but crazy as it may sound, I just need to do this run. Mentally, I just want to do it now. It's, it's, like, it's, it's like a cloud, it's like a dark cloud hanging over me. I haven't done the 100 mile and I need to do it. A few days before the race, we realized just how hot it was gonna be. And I'm not good with heat. 
and all of a sudden all those winter runs in the cold, thinking about the nutrition, how often I have to need to eat, how often I have to drink. I was then thinking, I'm going to have to double that because my body's just going to be fighting. I mean, when I look at this, it is unreal to think, and that's not everything. I've still got to pack a bag for the finish line and the 50 mark. This is what I'm taking. Get off my food. Get out of it. Sun cream and painkillers. Nutri I've got my salt tablets, I've got my electrolytes, I've got sweets, I've got cashew nuts. A head torch, spare battery. It's, it's a minefield. There's just so much to, to think, and it's got to go in here. I've, what I'm carrying is going to go in here. I, this sounds weird, but I look at all this and I just think, this is like a soldier's equipment. I know that sounds stupid, but it kind of feels I'm going to go to battle. You know, I've got to have my right equipment. And it's the same as someone turning up to a job to, I don't know, dig, dig a trench in the, in the street. You've got to have the right machinery. And, and this is all my machinery. This is all my equipment. When the sun, when there's races over about 23 degrees of 100 miles in the UK, the DNF rate shoots up because people go out too fast. Yeah. My genuine advice is, and it, hey, I don't know how hot it's going to be. They say it's going to be 28 30. degrees. Yeah, yeah. this is hot. And you're exposed a lot of the South Downs where it is exposed. In the heat of the day, if it is too hot, just walk that bit and yeah, you will save energy and just, just take it nice and steady. Don't feel like you have to smash it out. Even if you've got the energy, just brisk walk, brisk walk, just to keep your heart rate low so in I'm the heat. So, we don't let each other quit. No, we don't. Whatever happens, don't quit. No, we're getting to the You don't side. let me quit, I'll yeah. let you quit. It's really easy to focus on the downside of this race, the things that are going to hurt, but I've also got to remember there's going to be some beautiful aspects. I mean, the weather is going to be fantastic, I'm going to see for miles, or do I doubt it and think it's going to be way too hot, I'm going to burn, it's going to be horrific. No, I've got to put that out of my mind, put on my factor 50 and think I'm going to see some amazing views, I'm going to meet some brilliant like-minded people. The bond between me, Mike and Susie will be so strong after doing this 100 miles. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be the most scenic run I've ever done. There's some positives in this race which I need to focus on. The hardest thing for me is, and I've had this every time I've done the London Marathon, and I mean this with respect, lovely people overtake me and slap me on the back saying, come on mate, you're an Olympic medalist, you should be at the front. I was a sprinter and I, and I truly wasn't born for long distance. Every time I've done a marathon, I always get to about mile between 10 and 15, and I hit the wall really early. And whether you can retrain yourself, I don't know, but I've got a good reason for doing the challenge, and I think if I keep that in the back of my mind, hopefully I can get to the finish line. I'm feeling great, I'm feeling great. The, 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 foot, the foot really isn't good, but I'm trying my hardest to think about everything but. So I've gone through, my repertoire of dad jokes. <laughs> We've been talk talking stories of yesteryear. He's been really suffering from mile three. Um, but I think it's about mile, mile 10. He just decided he's going to put it in a box and off we go. Pain is temporary, yeah? I've got to remember, although it's come off my arm, I'm doing this, it did say there, for those less fortunate. I'm doing this for all the families who didn't see their boy come out of hospital. We went about two miles out of our way. Honestly, I'm not even exaggerating. I'm fuming. The well, white watch says 25.6 miles, and I don't think the next checkpoint's got till 25. Fair play to the race. They rang us and called us to tell us we were off course. 
That's an amazing so, organisation from them, fair play. So we just spun around and went back down. We blamed the marshal, and it wasn't the marshal's fault at all, it was us, we missed the turn in, so we're idiots. Um, but these things are said to dry us, so we go again. I know you said don't worry, but we went, it was up a hill in the midday sun. Couldn't have been worse. Um, Teddy, love you. Love you, Tedder. Love you, boy. It's okay. Yeah, Teddy's by far the best thing that's ever happened to me. I'd, I'd give away all of my medals, anything. I've, nothing I've achieved in my life can come close to being the dad of Teddy. Oh, he's amazing. As the day progressed, it was very, very warm. They were both slowing down in the heat. It's been tough. And it was so hot. It wasn't like a little bit, oh, the midday sun might be out soon. It was like from 5.30 when we got there to start, it was hot. I was sweating from half a mile in. Basically, Mike is <laughs> suffering in the heat. He's not good in the heat and he needs to be careful. He's stopped and Ewan's gone ahead. So, Do you know whereabouts he is? Yeah, I've got, he's three, he's three and a half miles away, but it's there. Okay, I mean, let's just see if we can intercept him. So. Well, he told me he was on a road and he's nowhere near a road. So I'm just, I just need to make sure he's... Hi, 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 hi. Are you moving? Are you moving? Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Okay, keep moving. You're really, you're, you're really inaccessible. For him to have a good race, he needs to know that you're okay. Are you okay? <sighs> Two minutes only. Now about 90 seconds. It's getting cooler and you're now going to where you know how to deal with it, which is night, tiredness, and a little bit of ultra pain. Have you eaten? Thirty seconds. You've got to get up. I need my. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get going. Okay. I will move. Okay. Well. You know how to deal with this. Seriously. I'm done. I'm done. So, forty percent of the way through, I'd say Ewan. He sounds good on the phone. Actually, he sounds uh, positive. But he's obviously hurting. It is a warm old day here on the South Downs, and people are cooking. Mike is feeling it, so they've split up, and Ewan's pushing on ahead. He told me to stop and I knew he was in trouble and I am too but I just I can't leave you and we talked for a couple of minutes and I phoned Susie, she says you've got to go and he wanted me to go but I feel bad but apparently he's, he's moving again so he'll probably catch me up in a minute but I felt horrendous like leaving him, he's such a good friend, you don't do that but he was adamant so I'm on my own and I've got blisters on both feet and we went wrong again. So I'm only 40 miles in, but I'm 43 miles in on my watch. 60 to go. It's such a long way to go still. We got him up, he got going, and I think that was, I think he also realised at that point that it was a big ask. And it'd be, he'd be more useful to you and joining the crew. Sorry to say, that's it for me. I'm gonna drop out of the next aid station. That's 48 miles done, but I've got nothing left. I gave it my all, I tried to carry on when it hurt. Uh, tried to carry on again, didn't work, it wasn't my day. It doesn't mean I can't do this. I can do this and I will be back and I'll do it again. It's just not my day today. Uh, I don't want to be a burden on the crew and I want to be there at the end to cheer you and in. So even if you're watching this, get to that track. It's cooling down now, mate. You're looking good. I think what will be difficult with this is the fact there's a lot of 
stuff I can't control. When I was an athlete, I had my little lane, the gun would go, I knew it was a lap of the track, no one could push me, no one could get in my way, there was no rock in my way, there was no bit of water to go through or tree to jog around. It, it was a smooth ride, if you want, a smooth track. All of a sudden now, I can't control the weather, I can't control my, my, my body. There's going to be times when I literally would be out of control. I'll be going down a hill out of control or I'll slip or there'd be something in my way or I need food or I need a sleep. There's, there's so many things that I can't be in charge of. so slow but it just feels like I'm sprinting. It's really weird. I've now gone further than I've ever been before. Well basically it all starts to really hurt from now. What happens is as the day turns into night your body expects to sleep and that of course doesn't come um, so he'll, he'll find it really challenging and of course everything just starts to, the hurt amplifies when you're tired so um, It'll be a long night, but he's, he's mentally, he's in the game. It's so hot. I mean, look, I'm pasty. I'm not designed for this. But I'm not designed to quit either. And that's why I won't quit. It's going to take something bad to make me stop this race. Overnight is always, as far as I'm concerned, the best bit of any 100 miler is where things come to life, <laughs> where it's normally the lowest ebb because your body should be asleep and you're fighting a lot of different things at that point and you still have a long way to go. So it's always really interesting. Overnight, Ewan was incredibly determined, but there was one point which probably was the most panicky point. We've had some bad news as we're going along in this race um, and Ewan's staying in it and doing his best to, to get to the finish so. As if today wasn't stressful enough, Teddy got rushed by ambulance to hospital, I just found out at mile 50. I was like, my head's all over the place, do I get home? And I can't even go in the hospital if I do get home. Oh man, his breathing's gone bad. So he's on a ventilator and stuff overnight and honestly, I, half of me thinks just stop, get in the car, get home. The other half thinks no, they want me to finish. The quicker I finish, the quicker I get home. Obviously if things get worse, I'll go, I'll go home. But at the moment there's nothing really I can do. I'm stuck in a fucking field, we're in the middle of nowhere. And this has got to be the hardest thing I have ever done. 63 odd miles in, 18 hours in, and I've still probably got 10 hours to go. That's what hurts my head, getting my head around. I've still got 40 miles to go. It's ridiculous. Hats off to people who do this. There's people who finished already. It's like, how on earth can people do this and enjoy it? Every bit of me wants to quit. Every single bit of me is saying, just stop, what are you doing? I've got nothing to prove. I made a living out of being an athlete. What am I doing this for? And then I remember, I'm doing it to raise awareness. I'm doing it to help other, to help other families. And that's why I have to keep going. I can smell chicken nuggets, so. Yeah, yeah this is gonna help. <laughs> Thanks, I won't be able to eat all that. <laughs> hey, one thing I will say, Chicken nuggets works for Usain Bolt, let's have it. If I'm truthful, it's hard to eat anything, it's just everything's so dry. Like one chicken nugget feels like I've had four Big Macs, my stomach just can't do it. I feel like I'm hallucinating. I'm just seeing things and different shapes and... Seriously, I can't even eat it. I just think whoever, people who do this and enjoy it, there's something wrong with them in the head because this is not natural for the human body to be up for over 18 hours and not stopping in the heat. This is my first and my last, my <laughs> everything. Um, well, I mean, we've done it before in training where we said, 
like um, right we're going to start running at this push and so just keep doing that and make these little these small deals with yourself and saying and it'll just start to bring the mile times down a couple of minutes and that's all he needs it'll be okay he just needs to, to, to pick it up a bit be brutal if he missed the cut off The race is broken down into something called checkpoints. They're approximately every 10 miles or so. You get to the checkpoint, you check in with the members of staff for the race, refuel, rehydrate, and then you get out of the checkpoint. Each of these checkpoints has a time by which all of the runners need to be through. And that's for their safety. That's to ensure that they've, they've got out of that checkpoint in time in order to make the next cut off time. We came to a checkpoint and Susie says, don't worry, we've got 20, 25 minutes, 24, 25 minutes. Approached the checkpoint. They said, quick, hurry up. I said, why? They said, you've only got four minutes to spare. That was disastrous because I was in pain. I just thought there's no way I'm going to make the next checkpoint if I've only got four minutes to spare now. You can do this, can't he, everybody? Yeah, Christ can. almighty, you come this far. Go on, you can. can do this, can't he? Come yeah. On. Keep it up, you, you got it, man. Pace it, pace it. Stride that walk out. But I think for me, that is when my proper switch turned on. It was so close to the cutoff, and I just had to keep him moving. I'd come so far, I had to finish. With everything going on in my mind, the reasons why I was doing this to start with, to only have four minutes to spare, I was, I was angry at myself. I felt a bit ashamed for some reason, embarrassed, and I just thought, I can't go out like this. I can't get disqualified. That was a pivotal moment in the race. Four minutes in a 29 hour race is absolutely nothing. We really, really had to dig deep and we really had work to do from that point onwards. We were 75 miles in, so he had a marathon to do. There wasn't a single minute after that point where Ewan wasn't working. We were literally trying to make up 20 seconds per mile for 25 miles. He was so determined. There was never a single point where, he, where giving up was, was an option. And I genuinely, it was, it was staggering. His resolve was solidified by that moment. And it was extraordinary to witness, absolutely extraordinary. So we were literally counting seconds. And Susie was like, you, you need to average 16, or well, I think it was 18 minute mile in, if you're gonna make it, just make it. So then one mile, I'd look at my watch, and go, oh, I'm doing 16, 20. That means I'm, I'm one minute, 20 up. If I can do that for three miles, I'm gonna make up, for, you know, and we were working out the time. But it was so desperate for time, I didn't even stop for toilet breaks. In the end, I didn't care. And I didn't even have time to stop, to turn, to go toilet in the bush. I was running while I peed. I turned the four minutes into 10 minutes to spare. Then the one after that, I had 15, and every second counted. Two minutes is a, it's 8.33, so I've got, I've got 25 minutes from now, so by the time I check in, it'll be 20 minutes in the hat. Go through stages where I feel brilliant, and I can have a bit of a run. And the realization is I've actually run 92 and a bit more. The thing about these races is that are very, very long, and I have seen people um, DNF, which do not finish. I've seen people not make it from mile 90, from mile 95. Um, it's really not over until you, you've hit that finish line. It's such a long way, and your body is, is really fighting. I think really, until you can visually see the finish line, you can't make any guarantees.
We looked at the clock and I had like whatever, 35 minutes and I could see I was going to make it. And then, then it became really real, but then I became really paranoid, thinking I've come this far, what if I pull my calf now? Or what if my hamstring or my knee goes or my ankle's broken or, you know, something bad happens. I was then working out, could I limp it and still make it, you know, or could I crawl to the finish line? So it was almost, I didn't want to admit I was going to make it until I got to that finish line. And you all saw my emotions and like, yeah, it was, yeah, it was mad. We entered the gates of the athletics stadium and I let him go and, and that, that was his, that last, those last couple of hundred metres on that track were his. Everything went through my head as I hit that track. It was like I, I was seeing visions of Teddy in intensive care as a baby. I was just thinking of hope, hopefully all the people I can reach, the message I can get out there by doing this. It all became like really vivid in my mind. That was 400 in my life, but never mind. <laughs> So emotional. <laughs> when I got to that cut off and they said you've got only got four minutes to spare and that was like still 30 miles to go, I was like, I ain't making it. I just had to dig really deep. And I think I took three minutes to do that last lap. It, the emotion, I, I, would, I tried to keep it together for the whole race. I tried to be really tough and in my mind, very, very focused and clear that I was going to get to that finish line. But then when the finish line came, I just lost it. I just like, the emotion started to come out and it was like, wow, that, I'm actually going to do it. I've actually done this. What I've trained for, what I set out to do. I'm sorry, I know I'm being proper emotional, but I can't believe I've done it. Thank you for everyone. Thank you to everyone who support, supported me. And it was so hard. I'm very much acknowledged in ultra circles are, well, in any race, I think, are the people who are on their feet the longest. They're the ones that have toughed it out the longest. They're the ones that have had to hold on to the vision of finishing the longest. Um, and with that comes huge respect, comes huge, huge respect. He totally deserved it. It was astonishing what he did. Because on paper he should have he would have should have imploded. That's the hardest thing I've ever done. I think the whole experience has made me really quite emotional, like even now sitting here. I won't, but I feel like I burst into tears just just thinking of everything, the months of training, the car crash the lack of training towards the end, will I be okay, won't I be okay, Mike dropping out, getting lost, Teddy getting ill, everything happened. But I would do it all again, I think. If there was a good reason for me to do it again, I would do it again. And I think if it's taught me anything, and I hope the lesson it will teach others, if you put your mind to something in life, don't let anything stop you. You can do it. If you believe you can do it, you'll do it.